So for the manual process, we're turning this piece into this piece in about 30 seconds on our Haas lathe here. It's a very simple process. The operator comes up, loads the blank into a pneumatic collet closer, and pushes the cycle start button. About 30 seconds later, we end up with this piece, which just barely protrudes from the face of the collet, as well as some chips on each of our tools. So the person will then take up an air hose, manually clear the chips from the tools, then extract the finished part from the collet using a pair of tweezers or some other device to, to grip the inside of the part, pull it out, and then repeat the process over and over. So basically it's three steps. Load the part, clear the chips, extract the finished part. We could make the robot do all three of these steps, but that's what we're gonna talk about next. Is that really the best way to go? So is that the best solution? In this case, I don't think it is. In the case of part extraction, to, to have the robot switch between the two grippers in this space, it really isn't practical. There's not enough room. So you either have to do one of two things. You have to remove the robot outside the working area of the lathe, or lift and lower the door. Both of these things are gonna take quite a bit of time and add to your cycle. So rather than do that, we thought that there's probably a better way to do this using some more dedicated components. All right, so we've identified our three problems. And of the three, we know that the robot has to tackle the loading of the parts. And we already established that we're gonna to try to implement dedicated solutions for the other two. In terms of order of operations, it's better to go ahead and implement the other two solutions and have them verified while a human standing here running the machine to ensure that those two are hardened and tested and we don't have any issues in that area. So the first of these two tasks we decided to automate was the part ejection. Our initial thoughts were, let's use compressed air to blow the parts out of the collet. To test this, we went and grabbed a, a, just a typical blow gun, inserted it to the rear of the spindle, and attempted to blow the parts out. Believe it or not, it actually worked. The problem with this is we had to buy a rotary union so that we don't twist the airlines up as the, as the collet spins. They're pretty pricey. So after talking to my guys, someone came up with the idea of putting a simple spring-loaded part ejector inside the collet. So we went ahead and drew up plans for one and machined it real quick and installed it. And it actually works really well. Our next step is to find a way to capture these parts and perhaps put them on a basket that's sitting on the carriage right here. So we have our basket sitting here on the carriage and we need a way to get our parts into the basket. So we've devised up this wonderful tube slide system and hose clamp and we're gonna align it properly by programming the machine to move over. And when you release the valve, part falls in the basket. Remember, it's not rigged if it works reliably. All right, guys, so we left off last time. We had just installed our spring ejector system and proved that it worked. And we talked about mounting our catch system using our PVC piping. As you can see here, we've got that all mounted up now. And we also have our, our air blow off for our tools. Uh, we did this using just simple lock line and this lock line manifold. We didn't want to have to go make any custom parts. We're feeding this manifold with a push neck fitting and a quarter inch poly line. If you follow me around in the back, you can see the, uh, the solenoid valve which lets air flow to the lock line. We're about to show you how that, we hook that up right now. All right, so we're back here in the electrical cabin of our lathe. Remember, make sure before you open the door, you cut the power off of the main breaker. We're gonna pull this panel off here to get to our M code relays. As you can see, they're up here in the corner of our board. We're wired here into our M21 relay, but we could have used any of these four. You can choose any of these, it's, it's irrelevant. Just make sure you use the corresponding on and off codes. This is our solenoid valve. We have our air coming in from our air supply here, and this is going out to our lock line manifold. So you gotta understand when we energize this solenoid, it's gonna open a valve and air is gonna flow through to our to our tools or to our lock line manifold. We're powering this using a this is a 24 volt solenoid, so we're powering it using a 24 volt power supply. 
doesn't matter what you use as long as the two are matched. So if this is 12 volts, you have need to have a 12 volt solenoid. We're gonna explain a little bit more in detail about how this is wired together. Also note that we've plugged our power supply into our GFCI plug on the outside of our machine, which you can plug it in anywhere. So you know things are about to get technical when we get the whiteboard out. Now we're gonna take a deep dive into exactly how to wire up our solenoid valve, our Haas M relay, and our power supply. To me, this was the most difficult part of the whole integration process. I'm a mechanical guy, so I had to really stop and take time to wrap my head around exactly where all the wires go. So what I believe is the most common misconception, and certainly what I did at first, was I tried to hook the solenoid up directly to my Haas M relay. I did this by hooking the positive to one of the terminals and the negative to the other. The problem with this is there's no power involved. This relay is simply a switch. So we never got power across our solenoid and it never opened. Most likely the other misconception is that we hook the air solenoid direct up to our power supply. In this case, we hook the two negative terminals together and the two positive terminals together. What happens in this scenario is the solenoid's always gonna be open, so you'll always flow air through. This is incorrect as well. It gives the machine no control over the situation. So the wiring that best suited our application was to go from the positive of the power supply to the positive of our air solenoid, from the negative of our power supply to the common leg, then from the common leg up to our M relay, and then from our normally open leg of our M relay back down to our air solenoid. So now what happens when the relay is tripped, power flows across the common, the normally open leg, and back down to the air solenoid, providing voltage from the positive to the negative leg. Now the reason we use the normally open leg rather than the normally closed leg is because we want this switch to be off most of the time, keeping this air solenoid shut. If we were to hook it up to our normally closed leg, there would always be voltage flowing and our air cylinder would be open most of the time and then our switch would be flipped and it would close it off. We're gonna use this logic a little later on dealing with our air chuck. So like I said, this is what best suited our application. Uh, this is how it works in my head. If you guys have any better suggestions or ideas, please share them with us, we'd, we'd love to hear about them. All right guys, so as you can see, in the back of the machine we have the M relays available, M21 through M25. We wired our solenoid into M21. So to turn this on, use the M code M51, and to turn it off, use M61. So we're gonna do a quick little demo program in MDI to show you how this works. So M51 to turn it on, G4P1, so we want it to turn on for one second, and then M61 to go ahead and turn it off. So write that in MDI, reset, and it should run, blow the air for one second. There you go. So now that we've got all the on-machine automation complete, I'm gonna go ahead and let my guys run this for a shift or two to prove out these particular tasks. We can't have the machine dropping parts and we can't have chips on the tools when the robot's in place. I find it's best to, to, to troubleshoot these things in steps rather than build the complete cell and then try to go back and troubleshoot each individual part. And it's gonna be a lot easier because the robot's not gonna be in the way. So in our next segment, we're gonna go ahead and bring the robot in front of the machine integrate into the cell as well as do the part presentation. Thanks for watching part two. Make sure to check out part three of the series where we wrap up our UR integration.